Recording a record or album is a bit of a mystery for most people. I've been working in audio for around 20 years, but as I talked about in my How I Became a Sound Tech video, I've always just focused on live sound as opposed to recording. Comparing live sound and recording is kind of like comparing farming and cooking. Both a farmer and a cook deal with food, but in very different ways. It's kind of the same for a live engineer and a studio person. Not to say that an engineer can't be good at both, but for the most part, you kind of focus on one or the other. Between the bands I've been in and my solo effort, I've played on 10 studio albums, the term studio being used very loosely on a few of the earlier recordings. Becoming a studio engineer can be a tricky thing to get into, especially with home recording studios being something fairly easy and cost-effective to build these days. For about $1,000 to $2,000, you can probably get your hands on a used computer with Pro Tools or something similar and a few mics to get you started. Even just GarageBand and a $100 interface can pump out some decent sounding stuff if the songs and playing are good. However, in the 90s, when my band Lacking Intelligence did our first record, home studio gear was still fairly new and expensive. Pro Tools wasn't quite available at the consumer level yet, so we recorded our debut record on ADAT. ADAT stands for Alesis Digital Audio Tape, and kind of looked like a VHS tape, which I am much too familiar with. An ADAT tape has eight tracks to work with, meaning you could record eight mics or things at once. If you were a real baller, you would rent another unit, hook them together, and have a total of 16 tracks. Some bands are amazing and will record an album live off the floor. Basically, everything is mic'd up at once and all the musicians play at the same time, usually capturing energy and a feel not present in the slightly more sterile one instrument at a time approach. Our band, Lacking Intelligence, although great in our own little way, wasn't quite one of those bands, however. Nor did we really have enough tracks to pull it off anyways. The recording process we went with was recording the drums first, with one of us playing guitar on a scratch track so the drummer had something to follow. Once the drums for all the songs were good enough, the engineer would then have to mix all the drum tracks down to only two tracks to free up enough space for the other instruments. Bass would usually be the next thing to record on all of the songs, then guitar, vocals, VG vocals, and bam, you had an album on your hands. Admittedly, back then, I was fairly oblivious to the whole process and kind of just there to play guitar and do vocals. My friend Rory was the brave soul who recorded the album. He also would be the one credited with producing the album. Not necessarily by choice, but kind of by default, as the rest of us had no clue what was really going on, and we appreciated the direction he gave. Online, there are two definitions for produce. Make or manufacture from component or raw materials, or cause a particular result or situation to come into existence. Producing a record is kind of maybe the middle point between these two. In my opinion, ultimately a producer's job is to be on quality control. The good enough or do it again person. The person who kind of has the vision of what the final album will sound like and to make sure the vision is realized. Many engineers kind of end up being an engineer slash producer at the same time like Rory did. Sometimes it works better that way. Around the time of the first Lacking Intelligence recording might have been when I actually started to show interest in who produced some of the albums I liked so much. I was huge into Fat Records, Epitaph, and other 90s punk stuff. It was kind of a surprise that on so many of the albums I liked, the same person was listed as producer. The person kind of unofficially credited with pioneering the fat record sound of the 90s, Ryan Green. Ryan Green is an American record producer, sound engineer, and studio owner of Area 52 Studios in Los Angeles, California. He has worked with a ton of giant artists across a bunch of different genres like Jay-Z, Mr. Big, Wilson Phillips, Megadeth, Alice Cooper, Cheap Trick, and Usher. At 15, 
Green was already playing drums in local LA bands. Two weeks after graduating high school, he landed the front of house gig at the legendary Troubadour in West Hollywood. By 19, he had a position with MCA Music, becoming the youngest first engineer the company ever had at 20 years old. Trying to stitch a timeline together that coincides with albums he is credited for online seems to not quite match up. I wasn't able to find his age. Not that age is important, but it might have helped pin down what year it was when Green hit the ground running post high school. On allmusic.com, he is listed as engineering an album in 77 for Pete Magazine called Bones Blues. Then nothing till 88. I'm guessing either the listing is incomplete for Green's handiwork in the early to mid 80s, or the 77 listing is incorrect, and the late 80s is probably when he really got his foot in the studio door. Green engineered all of the pre-production on Megadeth's album, Countdown to Extinction. The actual album was tracked early 1992, so one could assume the pre-pro was at some point in 1991. 92 and 93 has Green listed on a handful of other projects across multiple genres, but it wasn't until 1994 that he met the owner of Epitaph Records and guitarist for Bad Religion, Brett Guritz. Ryan Green recorded three songs for Bad Religion prior to the release of Stranger Than Fiction, my personal fave Bad Religion album. Green knew nothing of the modern punk sound and perhaps drew inspiration from the Megadeth sessions in terms of drum sounds and guitar tones. Or maybe Green was just a fresh set of ears that was able to think a bit outside the box of what punk had sounded like, sonically speaking, for the last 10 years or so. The three songs went awesome, and Mr. Brett was so impressed, he called the songs the best sounding thing Bad Religion had done to date. Gertz wanted to know if Green did records outside of MCA, with one specific punk band in mind on his label. Not long after the three-song Bad Religion session, Ryan Green was introduced to Fat Mike, the front person of No Effects. Seemingly, the two hit it off, and Green signed up to record Punk and Drublick, No Effects's fifth studio album, which ended up being their biggest selling record, becoming certified gold. Again, I feel Green drew a lot of inspiration in terms of the approach of recording the record from working with Megadeth. No Effects's previous album, White Trash, Two Heaves, and a Bean, already had a punchy, clicky kick drum sound and guitar tones with a lot of distortion, but it wasn't as cohesive as the Punk and Drublick album was. All the sounds and instruments on Punk and Drublet just fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. The drums, although super duper fast, were tight and every hit was present, as opposed to the kick sound in White Trash that kind of wandered in and out at times. The snare sound was more focused and sat higher in the mix in Punk and Drublet, more similar to how someone might mix a metal band. The guitar tones were chunky especially during the palm muted parts. Following recording Punk and Drublick, Green has a few R&B and other projects listed that he worked on later in 1994, but obviously word spread about what he had done on No Effects's record, and for the next 10 plus years, his schedule would be full with nothing but punk bands looking to capture some of the magic he unleashed on the Punk and Drublick recording. Razor's Edge was a recording studio founded by Jonathan Burnside in the Haight and Asbury area in San Francisco. Alongside several other studios, these grungy old spaces became ground zero for Ryan and Mike to crank out album after album of 90s SoCal punk goodness. Green produced, mixed, and or recorded something like 20 records over the next year and a half, with almost all of them becoming iconic albums and bands in the punk genre, setting a new standard for how things are done in the punk scene. It was a perfect balance of pristine and chaos, calculated yet improvised. It wasn't easy, however, and Ryan has said he worked 17-hour days, seven days a week. For a year and a half, he had no days off. Worked Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's, his birthday, Thanksgiving, the guy was a machine.
In 97, Fat Mike and Ryan Green started Motor City, a studio in the San Francisco area. And over the next eight years, the pair worked on something like over 100 albums. Punk music exploded in the late 90s, spilling into the mainstream and becoming accessible for suburban teen punk wannabes like yours truly. A wave of punk that rose so high, one swore it would never break and roll back. But good times come and good times go. People get old and responsible, with different priorities navigating their lives. Styles and tastes change. As the momentum of the punk scene finally started to slow, by the mid-2000s, Mike and Ryan had a falling out during the recording of the album 10,000 Shots by The Real Mackenzies. Mike played most of the bass on the album, but I wasn't able to find the nature of the disagreement. Maybe it was over something serious, or maybe it was just time to move on. Ryan Green founded Crush Recording Studios in Scottsdale, Arizona later the same year and continued recording. He branched out from the 10 plus year streak of being the go-to guy for the punk scene exclusively and worked with Usher during this period on the Here I Stand album. Perhaps sick of the weird ass laws in Arizona, in 2009, Green sold Crush Recording to start a new recording facility called Area 52 in Los Angeles. Recording everything from Tower of Power to Megadeth to more no effects records, Green continued to pump out amazing recordings by some of the best artists around. In 2014, he swore to only work 10 hours a day, six days a week, although has been seen sitting in his car outside the studio on his days off. It's hard to find a bad thing anyone has said about Ryan Green. Cafe of No Effects called Green smart and good at what he does and says they learned a lot from him. Ryan works really fast while remaining anal, says Hefe, well-organized and more meticulous than other producers we have worked with. Strung out guitarist Rob Ramos recalled his studio time with Green as being such a fun environment for whoever is around those sessions. We're just laughing all day, says Ramos. He's so easygoing and everyone's comfortable. Jordan Burns, drummer of Strung Out, says Green was a consultant, a psychiatrist, an idealist, and a realist. The camaraderie was insane at times. Ryan would come in and say, that is not a Jordan Burns beat. Anyone can play that. Play it like Jordan Burns would. According to Green, who is a drummer himself, Burns is one of the most solid and even drummers he worked with during the fat years. Dave Ron from Lagwagon is the most powerful and very creative. Eric Sandine of No Effects has the best foot in the business and the most relaxed player. Punk music and the punk scene has had a huge impact on my life and gave myself and friends a place to go, like-minded people to turn to, and a community to draw support and inspiration from when things got hard. I was kind of surprised one of the people at the center of it all in the 90s wasn't even a punk. I mean, I'm sure working with all these amazing bands, Ryan Green soon gained an ear for the genre. Speaking from experience, as someone who worked with all sorts of bands and genres on a professional level, if the music is good, it's easy to get into it, regardless if you ever listened to that particular style before. I've never subscribed to the only punks can listen to punk belief, and that was part of what really drew me to the scene. If you didn't look the part, you were still welcome to come to the shows and check out the bands. Punk to me is a lifestyle, a do what you want to do idea. If you compare the high water mark where the giant wave of the punk scene finally broke and rolled back to what the punk scene became today, it's but a whisper of its former yells. But the DIY and cooperative attitude is still present. If you used to be a punk, perhaps you never were. Ryan Green is an inspiration. His work ethic and knowledge of recording is something to strive for. Whether he believed in the ideals of the punk scene, just loved the music, or maybe it was only a paycheck, it doesn't take away from the fact that he played a role in shaping a genre of music all love till my ears stop working.